Okay, um, welcome everybody to OT with DA. Welcome YouTube, welcome Instagram. Uh, for those of you that are on YouTube, we have just been talking about dogs, <laughs> um, large and small dogs, and dogs that are so small that they're not actually considered dogs, at least by me. But Jennifer and I are not gonna talk about dogs anymore because this is something that we do not see eye to eye on because she's favorable to small dogs, and I'm not. So Jennifer, from right now, from, from no this more. point forward, this is a no dog zone. We're praying for unity. Okay, so I'm gonna move this over here. We are back. Tonight is a double chapter. How's that? Does that work? That's good. Tonight's a double chapter. We're gonna be looking at Prophets and Kings chapter 50 and 51. Mm. And I'll be totally honest with you, I'm tired. I'm yes. not normally tired when travel I do these, today. but I had a big travel day today. I was up at 2.30 a.m. this time. Wow. 4.30 a.m. Eastern time. So I'm I'm kind of tired. Yeah. But we are gonna, but I'm but to be clear, my tiredness is moderated by my enthusiasm for these two You're chapters. You're so enthusiastic. So I'm ready to go. You are. But what we probably will do is just kind of keep it moving. Mm -hmm. Right, just kind of keep moving, mm -hmm. keep motoring. We got two chapters to cover. Jennifer's done the rubric; she selected words. We have not talked about these chapters at all. Nope. She knows the rules. I wanted to, but he said no. We don't. In do fact, that you way. actually tried to say, "Hey, do you want to debrief?" And I no. said, "No, we're not going to do that." Jennifer's going to be with us. Is today Tuesday? Today's Tuesday, and then Wednesday and Thursday. So you're with us for three days. Three days. And each of those days, we're doing a double chapter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to do fifty and fifty-one today. Mm -hmm. Fifty-two, fifty-three, fifty-four, fifty-five. Yeah, and we're going to try. And we're going to okay. try to do a supplementary session, which Jennifer has a real passion about, because we've only done one other supplementary session in Prophets and Kings, okay. which was with Elise, Elise and it yeah. was on animals. Yeah, yeah animal really cool. welfare. Mm -hmm. Animal welfare. And Jennifer, just give us a brief... I want to what do, do you a, want to do a supplementary, a supplementary session? Because I think on. there's a lot in the story, particularly of Nehemiah and the whole theme of I will not come down from the wall that ministers to and speaks to the whole issue of boundaries with human beings, you know, which is a fairly popular topic, you know, how to relate to other human beings in a way that's boundary that that preserves us from undue exploitation, mm, getting hurt, mm. um, just I love having it. healthy boundaries. And so I'm going to go into kind of a deep dive on that. So uh, we're going to do a supplemental session on boundaries. We don't yet know what day that will be, and we might not do it live. So because yeah. it'll just depend on on the time and all of well, that. We can't do it live. Yeah, well, we could, but we just might not because okay. we're going to do it in the day. All right. So we'll keep you posted. If it's not live, it will certainly be available on the YouTube channel. Yeah. So we might do it live. We might yeah. not. We'll let you know because it might just be kind of a spur of the moment thing because Jennifer has a real passion for it. Mm -hmm. Because as a... Counselor. Counselor, traumatologist, right. all of the things that you and are. And also a human being. That's and a human being. had a hard road learning how to have boundaries with people. Healthy you know? boundaries. Good good boundaries that leave room for self-sacrifice and hmm. service and all of that stuff. So I'm going to try to balance it biblically because a lot of the stuff that's called boundaries is just basically sanctimonious sounding selfishness. Uh, we don't want that. We want to okay. live the life. You know, We want to follow Jesus, but also not do it in a reckless way. So, I love that. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So that will be a supplemental session that's on boundaries, sort of rooted in and against the backdrop of the story of Nehemiah, yes, who had to have very good boundaries. That's right. He had a work to do and he couldn't be distracted. That's right. Okay. So we're tonight in chapters 50 and 51. Chapter 50 is called Ezra, the priest and scribe. Mm. We're going to start there. We're going to spend about mm, 40 minutes on this chapter. We'll try to spend about 40 minutes on each chapter. So that's going to require us to kind of move along. Okay. Jennifer, I'll ask you to open with prayer if you don't mind, and we'll get right into this. Father in heaven, thank you so much. I've been pleasantly surprised at how fascinating these stories are. Mm. I've been moved by the characters in the stories. The Ezra, the priest, was such a, an amazing human being. It mm -hmm. made me want to spend time with him and be around him. Nehemiah is an incredible stalwart and warrior, and I've just been so moved and impressed by them. And I just want to pray that as we unpack these chapters, your Holy Spirit visits us in a very Amen. special way Amen. so that the things that we bring forth from these chapters are edifying and helpful and instructive to the people that are listening. It's our prayer Amen. in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Beautiful, Jen. Thank you. Mm, I love welcome. the way you pray. I love the way you speak. God has given you such a gift of communication. Thank you. 
Um, okay, so chapter 50, this is page 580 of the Types and Symbols. Looks like it's page 607 of the original. Mm -hmm. And Jen, I'm gonna put you right on the spot, oh, if you great. don't mind, and okay. have you just read the opening paragraph. Okay. Are you willing to do that? Sure. About 70 years after the return of the first company of exiles under Zerubbabel and Joshua, Artix Xerxes Longimanus, did I say that the way you I have no it? idea. Came to the throne of Medo-Persia. The name of this king is connected with sacred history by a series of remarkable providences. Hmm. I really came to love him, by the way. Yeah, in, yeah, yeah, in the yeah, course yeah. Of this chapter. Yeah, totally. It was during the reign that Ezra and Nehemiah lived, his reign that Ezra and Nehemiah lived and labored. He is the one who in 457 BC issued the third and final decree for the restoration of Jerusalem. His reign saw the return of a company of Jews under Ezra, the completion of the walls of Jerusalem by Nehemiah and his associates, the reorganization of the temple services, and the great religious reformation instituted by Ezra and Nehemiah. During his long rule, he often showed favor to God's people and in his trusted and well-beloved Jewish friends, Ezra and Nehemiah, he recognized men of God's appointment raised up for a special work. Hmm. Great opening paragraph. It's incredible. One of the things that Ellen White does really well, just generally, just as a, as a general observation, is her opening paragraphs are often such great summaries mm -hmm. of what's to come. Yeah. And this opening paragraph is mm -hmm. uh, no exception. So we're not going to spend any time on the 457 BC date, though it is a very significant, prophetically significant date, because it's, it's the it, beginning of the 70-week prophecy. And it's of note that there are three three correct. returns, and this is the final one. The, and this is the most comprehensive yeah. of the returns. Yeah. And as I say there, it is the beginning of the 70-week prophecy of Daniel 8 and 9, mm -hmm. the 2300-day prophecy of Daniel 8. I mean, there's so much going on here. So much significance, here. like, wrapped up in this. Correct. Yeah. But what we're dwelling on here, and we will... Do, talk about these prophecies later when we get mm -hmm. to the Great Controversy, the book, The Great Controversy in The Conflict Beautiful. But now we're dwelling on the story, mm -hmm. the narrative of Ezra. And I really like the language there mm -hmm. of the remarkable providences. Mm -hmm. I mean, you think about, this is really, it's astonishing actually that you would have a series of Medo-Persian monarchs and even Babylonian monarchs that were favorable to God's it's people. It's incredible. And here, not just favorable in the, in the terms of the Medo-Persian monarchs, but actually becoming friends. I mean, she uses the word friends she here. She uses the word friends. And, the, and, and, and he, was, he was really inspired by their lives and yeah. their witness in a really personal way. By their example. And, and hugely sympathetic mm -hmm. to their cause. Because yeah. remember that the, the, the Jewish people were not originally the slaves or the captives of the Medo-Persians. They were the slaves and captives of the Babylonians. Mm -hmm. So when Babylon is conquered by Medo-Persia, the Medo-Persians are kind of like, who are you people? What are you doing here? Why do you have unusual practices relative to some of the other people in the area? Mm -hmm. And then they begin to learn like, oh, we're not from here. Mm -hmm. We're from hundreds of miles away mm -hmm. to the West. And the, the story begins to emerge. And the, the leaders of uh, the monarchs of Medo-Persia are favorably disposed mm -hmm. to the Jewish people, especially mm -hmm. certain Jewish people, mm -hmm. such that they issue these series of decrees where they're like, look, go back home. Go do, rebuild your temple. Go you rebuild do you. your city. Yeah, that's incredible. I, it's it's actually, you know, Ellen White here says that they were remarkable providences, and they were that. Yeah, they were. Because they would have been uh, a, an economic resource and, to the Medo-Persian Empire, just like they were to the Egyptian or the Babylonians. So why not keep them and enslave them? But God gave favor. And what was, what was the motivation? What was in it for them? Exactly. Because these were kings, you know, and they were always thinking in terms of building their kingdom. But right. I'm asking the question, honestly, like what, what was going on with their hearts and minds as they did this? Because wasn't Israel, they weren't a separate nation, mm. but they had some level of autonomy. Of course they did. Once they rebuilt Jerusalem. So yeah. what, what would they be considered? Well, they were, a, they were a vassal state yeah. under yeah. the, well, they had been a vassal power under the Babylonians. And yeah. then now when they return, they'll be yeah. at least loosely under the Medo-Persian. Right. Then eventually Greece and Rome, etc. But would they some how contribute to the kingdom itself? Well, in some sense, perhaps, yeah. but there was specific instructions, as we see in these chapters, that they were not, the priests especially, were not to be forced to pay taxes. Right, right. And there was some loss. I mean, the yeah. idea, we kind of have this idea here that like yeah. all cultures are created equal and all culture, that's not true. 
There are better and worse cultures, mm -hmm. and the Medo-Persian culture, at least based on what we get in, in sacred, mm -hmm. uh, sacred history, scriptural history, mm -hmm. is that they were more favorably disposed to Jehovah, to the, the people Babylon. that worship Jehovah, than Babylon, exactly mm -hmm. right. And one of the things that comes up here mm -hmm. in, I, I reread Ezra, the whole book of Ezra, mm -hmm. and it's really obvious that Jerusalem was sort of viewed Jerusalem and the Jews were viewed by the surrounding nations as rebellious, as seditious, as really? not very good. Yeah. Really? Like when you actually read those letters that were written back and forth between the early Persian monarchs, you know, going back before the time of Ezra, mm -hmm. going back to the initial return of the 50,000, like they were viewed very negatively by the surrounding okay. nations. I mean, they were a disobedient people. They were a seditious people. They were... They were not viewed positively. This is so it's all more a miracle that these that Artaxerxes exactly right. Well, he was so favorably his, impressed with yeah. people like Ezra. Yeah, and you know, you know, there's that great line, or it's actually a tragic line, but it occurs regularly in the Old Testament that the name of God is blasphemed, blasphemed among, among the, the Gentiles, Gentiles because, because of, you. of you. So that's the idea that that Israel was supposed to be a light, but their actual reputation with the surrounding nations was that they were largely disobedient, largely seditious, yeah. largely cantankerous. Well, because of Babylon and all that was bound up in that. And and debacle. Nebuchadnezzar came to understand, mm -hmm. as did the various Medo-Persian monarchs, that Yahweh had punished Israel through Babylon. Which was true. Exactly. So so this is a remarkable problem. And then he punished Babylon for the way Because they, they overdid they it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah and then he punished Babylon for the way that they, <laughs> they punished were, Israel. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> they so, thought they were scot free, but it was like, no. So uh, Ezra's the hero of this chapter. Of course, God, Yahweh, is the hero of mm -hmm. every chapter of the Bible. But in at least the more, mm -hmm. more proximal sense, Ezra's the hero of the story. Yeah. He comes into favor with mm -hmm. uh, Artaxerxes, and Artaxerxes learns of. Because Ezra's a scribe. He's a scholar, really, is what he is. He's a priest. He's a scribe. He's a scholar. He's a teacher. And he's not hes not a staff of the king. He's hes right. operating within the Jewish community mm -hmm. as a priest, and he was trained in that, and he ministered to the people, but he wasn't directly involved with the, you know, the king and his staff and it, so forth. If you look at the next yeah. paragraph, it says, The experience of Ezra while living among the Jews who remained in Babylon— was so unusual yeah. that it attracted the favorable notice of King Artaxerxes. In other words, what she means here by so unusual is he was an extraordinary man. And word got to King Artaxerxes that there's this extremely scholarly, extremely erudite, extremely intelligent person named Ezra, and you should meet him. Yeah. And then it says, with whom he talked freely regarding the power of God, the power of the God of heaven, and the divine purpose in restoring the Jews to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the things you, you have to love about Ezra as he's presented in this chapter is that he's not only a scholar's scholar, mm -hmm. a scribe and a priest, he's an evangelist. That's right. Right. He's he's a he's evangelizing he's a to the king. Force he's a, of nature. He's a force of nature. Yeah. I mean, what what a character what a Ezra guy. was. Oh. And to be honest, in sort of Jewish history, Old Testament history, mm -hmm. this is the period, what's sometimes called Second Temple Judaism, that I am the least familiar with. Hmm. Right? Like, I don't know yeah. a lot about Ezra and Nehemiah and Zerubbabel. I know it enough to, you know, have a functional knowledge, but but it's really remarkable just how awesome Ezra is. He comes off as almost a Daniel figure. He's incredible. And kind of a Moses figure, too. Well, we're going to hit it in the next chapter, but his prayer. Oh, it's it's straight out of <gasps> Daniel 9. That's crazy. Straight out of Daniel 9. It's crazy, yeah. Um. So then the next paragraph, Jen, I'll put you right on the spot to read the next paragraph, which begins, Born of the Sons of Aaron. Ezra had been given a priestly training, and in addition to this, he had accepted a familiarity with the writings of the acquired, excuse me, a familiarity with the writings of the magicians, the astrologers, and the wise men of the Medo Persian realm. So, Which what in the world? Yeah. He's a scholar. Yeah. But he was not He's a learner. He wants to know stuff. But he was not satisfied with his spiritual condition. There you go. He longed to be in full harmony with God, he longed for wisdom to carry out the divine will. And so he prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it. This led him to apply himself diligently to a study of the history of God's people as recorded in the writings of prophets and kings. He searched the historical and poetical books of the Bible to learn why the Lord had permitted Jerusalem to be destroyed and his people carried captive 
into a heathen land, it's mm. kind of shocking to me that he didn't know all that already. Right, exactly. You know? well, I think I think he would have probably known the, the oral general, story, the yeah. general story, yeah. but he's searching diligently. He's going back and reading through the historical books, the poetical books, the Psalms and others. Whatever was written down at that time in the various scrolls, mm. uh, certainly Torah, the, mm -hmm. the writings of Moses, and he wants right. to understand as best as possible, what how happened? did we get here? <laughs> What How did we get here? And he would have been familiar with the chronicler and the mm -hmm. king, you know, insofar as the chronicles and the kings and the books of Samuel were written, mm -hmm. he's familiarizing himself with the history, the sacred history of his own people. Mm -hmm. And so here again, we see this, this erudition, this scholarly interest. He's a learner. Mm -hmm. In fact, at one point, she says here, he's even looking into the, you know, the magicians, the astrologers, the wise men of the Medo-Persian realm. And, and I want to ask you a question, Jen, as a counselor mm -hmm. and as an inveterate follower of Jesus, mm -hmm. she says here something very interesting. She says he was not satisfied with his spiritual condition. Yeah. This kind of reminds me of blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, I see him as like, he, he was like a seminarian. Like he was the, he was the scholar, mm -hmm. he was the nerd. He had all of this knowledge, but he'd gotten kind of caught up in the ivory tower, maybe you could say. Okay. And then, he wanted a more practical religion that met the people. I like that. And, I like that. And, and the more spiritual movement in his life, more movement of the Holy Spirit. I like that. Because he was probably the kind of guy that tended to get a little locked up in his head, mm -hmm. it would be my guess. Yeah, yeah. No, I think yeah. you're exactly right. Yeah. So here's my question, just brought, just generally speaking, Yeah. in what sense is it healthy and in what sense is it unhealthy to be unsatisfied with our spiritual oh, that's condition? That's a good question. So we want to avoid scrupulosity, which is a condition where the person is constantly overwhelmed with a sense of guilt and that they're, you know, insufficient spiritually. Um, mm. Imposter syndrome where people, I remember being a new Christian and being surrounded with all these really uber spiritual people and just feeling like I was going to get busted and they were going to find out that I wasn't real. Mm. You know, um, that's called imposter syndrome. You can be ever so sincere qualified or whatever and you have this sense that you're going to get busted you're going to get caught and everybody's going to find out that you're a fake even though you're not so that can enter into the picture for people who are highly conscientious they can become so obsessed with whether they're measuring up or not to their level of what their level of consecration should be that subtly their religious experience becomes me-centered mm. because their religious experience is more about whether they are spiritual enough or not, and it's less about God himself. I hmm. see this a lot with young people who are part of, you know, the spiritual movements in the Adventist church. And a lot of them are just remarkably young people that have high standards and they want to do great things with their lives. They're very committed to God, but they're so tortured inside because they feel that they're not measuring up. And that comes to characterize their experience and they have effectively embraced humanism, some of them, mm. where they think that everything rises and falls on whether they're sp spiritual enough or not. Wow, so, yeah. kind of like yeah. uh, uh, like biblical humanism, fascinating. Exactly, Biblically exactly. informed humanism. So that's, that's one extreme. And the other extreme is not caring and not really being sensitive in your conscience to the movement of the Holy Spirit. And um, being like, no, yeah. I'm fine. That's the Laodicean condition, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, and so the Lord wants to rattle our cage a bit and get us to really care you know, and ask ourselves, um, am I where God wants me to be? Is, mm. Am I where I could be at this point in my Christian experience? Are there any sort of gaping holes in my program that the energy and strength and power is you know, seeping out mm. and I don't have as much to devote to the Lord? You know, um, and that's a good thing. That's all really good. Within a, within a, within a range. So we want to avoid the, the two ditches, the ditch of overscrupulosity right. and a kind of biblically informed humanism where everything rises and falls on me. Right. And also a laxness and indifference and apathy, a Laodiceanism right. that says I'm fine when I'm not fine. That's right. So, so do you have any, just to put you right on the spot, Jen, again, yeah. this is unscripted. Can you give us like so, any little advice uh, either know. as a counselor or yeah. as a inveterate follower of Jesus? Like, how do we know that we're not in that ditch and we're yeah. not in that ditch? How do we walk that well, line I think so it, that we're healthily yeah. unsatisfied with our present spiritual condition so that we can grow, but we're not unhealthily unsatisfied? Well, I think that paragraph in the book Steps to Christ where it says, who do you love to talk about? <laughs> okay. And and so the scrupulous person, the person with a sensitive conscience is going to say, well, I guess I'm falling short because I don't only talk about Jesus and I guess I'm not spiritual enough. But actually, um, it's, it's correcting that because 
you're talking about yourself if you're talking about how you're not talking <laughs> enough about Jesus. I don't talk so, enough about Jesus. Yeah, yeah okay, once exactly. again. So, so rather than do that, say, okay, maybe I should try talking about Jesus and what he can do for me that I can't do for myself. Love it. No matter what I do. So, so Jesus I, is the barometer. I think so. Because Jesus will keep us out of the scrupulous ditch because we're looking to him, we're trusting in him, it's his righteousness. You know what I do, David, is Go when ahead. I start feeling like, man, I'm just not measuring up and I don't think I'm, I think I'm unworthy. You know what I do is I say, you know what? It's true. Yeah. I'm not. But the gospel is sufficient Come on for now. people like me. Come on now. And I let that sense of unworthiness and that shame and that sense of insufficiency drive me to the cross where I learn that Jesus is my sufficiency. Come on. And I don't mean to be Woo! you know cliche, but it's true, you know, that that he came to save people like me. Amen. And so I, I nothing let that cliche drive about me. that, sister. Yeah, I let that drive me to him. Okay. So let's go back. Beautiful. Thank you, Jen. And I that's you right on the spot and your answer was superb. That's what righteousness by faith is, Amen. is, is when we say I'm not worthy, but then he forgives and loves and gives us grace anyway. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Amen. Beautiful. Okay. So uh, carrying on here a little bit, when we jumped out, jumped down a couple paragraphs here, let's go down to the next paragraph, not the next one, but the one after that. Ezra endeavored to gain a heart preparation. This is page 579, 609 of the original. Ezra endeavored, you got it? Uh, you might have gone a little too far. It's just okay. right there. Ezra yeah. endeavored to gain a heart preparation for the work he believed was before him. He sought God earnestly that he might be a wise teacher in Israel. As he learned to yield mind and will to divine control, there were brought into his life the principles of true sanctification, which in later years had a molding influence, not only upon the youth who sought his instruction, but upon all others associated Notice with him. Notice that he learned to yield mind and will to divine control. Mm. So I, I like to think of it this way. And actually a guy named Brian Holland helped me with this. He's from Oklahoma Academy and he's been a prince or he's been involved there for years. So he says your, your spiritual experience starts out with surrender, but then daily you learned how to depend on God. Mm. And so notice that it said, essentially said that he learned, he learned, there was a learning curve involved in learning how to, you know, surrender over and over again. Yeah. Learning to, to surrender control. to God is a skill. It's a skill. So many things we just say yeah. almost, you know, piously and platitudinously. Yeah. We're like, oh, just surrender. Whatever. Okay. Yes. But, but yeah. like one of the, one of the major things that we talk about in our marriage book is that marriage is a skill. A skill set. Right. Like there's a skill set. You learn skills and then you can more easily be happily married. Well, Christianity is also made up of skills, right? Like you, we learn how to surrender. We learn how to be healthily, you know, unsatisfied. We learn things, how to serve, how to minister, how to study, how to. In other words, everything that you will have as you grow in the Lord, you don't have at Thank the beginning you, of Jesus. the journey, which makes it much more interesting because if everything came to you right off the bat, Correct. why continue? Correct. Where's the mystery? Where's the intrigue? And where's the incentive to go forward? And when you see the Christian faith, you know, your growth in the Christian faith as the acquiring of skills and abilities yeah. and knowledge that you didn't formally have, yeah. then you won't have this mindset, oh, I failed. Yeah. You'll have the mindset, I, I'm learning. It, I'm growing. That's right. Even in your failures. It's called, in, in, in education, it's called a growth mindset. And teachers have found that when they see kids as either being gifted or not, that it disincentivizes kids from learning. But if they teach them that you all have a brain and let's t think of it in terms of growth. Everybody can grow. Then Thank it you. incentivizes that That's process. incredible. A growth yeah. mindset, yeah. which is which is what Ezra has. He has a growth mindset. Um, so, next paragraph, God shows Ezra as an instrument of good to yeah. Israel, that he might put honor upon the priesthood, the glory of which had been greatly eclipsed during the captivity. Ezra developed into a man of extraordinary learning and became a skilled scribe in the law of Moses. Just, These qualifications made him an eminent man in the Medo-Persian kingdom. So, <laughs> so notice the, the, the words here, instrument, right. honor, a ready scribe, extraordinary, yes. eminent. Like she was layering him. Big words. With big words. That's exactly right. I mean, he's, yeah. he is, and the very, look at the, look at the, at the very beginning of the next paragraph. Ezra became a mouthpiece, mouthpiece for God. And it goes on, piety, zeal, witness. I mean, she really exactly. loved him and, and rightly so. And and the reason, and this comes out of the chapter, the reason that Ellen White has, that takes this extremely high view of Ezra, well, first of all, he's clearly a hero, but specifically it's because he is a student of the word, mm -hmm. right? Like that comes up over and over again. In fact, just look at the next paragraph, the efforts of mm -hmm. Ezra. Why don't you read that for us, Jen? The efforts of Ezra to revive an interest in the study of the scriptures 
were given permanency by his painstaking lifelong work of preserving and multiplying the sacred writings. He gathered all the copies of the law that he could find and had those transcribed and distributed. The mm -hmm. pure word thus multiplied and placed in the hands of many people gave knowledge that was of inestimable value. So he's a publisher he's a as well. Word. He's a Gutenberg, exactly right. He's a publisher. Day. Yeah. He's like, he, he knows that he's not the source, that the word is the source, the law is the source, Torah is the source. Mm -hmm. So he's acquiring all of the copies of the of the historical writings, the poetical books, the writings of Moses that he can, and he's having scribes transcribe them, mm -hmm. and he's getting them into the hands of the people and the priests, mm -hmm. and he's teaching them to teach. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. It's incredible. Just absolutely it's a, amazing. It's the discipleship model. It, it's where exactly it doesn't all it come is. from him, but he's empowering the people to then teach others. Yeah. Okay, so then Ezra believed that God was going to do a mighty work for his people. Yeah. This brought him into, you know, providentially into the favor of Artaxerxes. And in the course of those conversations, Ezra declares his perfect trust in the God of Israel. And he begins to tell mm -hmm. Ezra about the temple, about the rebuilding of the temple, mm -hmm. about the walls that remained unbuilt I mean, at this point. Have been friends with the guy. Uh, yeah, well, she says friends. To, yeah, it's incredible. Like, it's really a great story. Yeah. Um, then we get this really great paragraph here, the decree of Artaxerxes. Yeah. You see that? Yeah. The decree of Artaxerxes for the restoring and building of Jerusalem the third issued since the close of the 70 years captivity is remarkable for its expressions regarding the God of heaven for its recognition of the attainments of Ezra and for the liberality of the grants made to the remnant people of God. So when you actually go back and read this in Ezra, Artaxerxes in like the strongest possible language is basically saying, take whatever you need from the royal treasury, go back with my blessing, with my protection. He promises soldiers. That's now right. they're going to decline those they're soldiers. They're going to decline a certain aspect. But, but you just see, again, these are remarkable providences. Yeah. And one of the things, Jen, that I often pray when I have speaking appointments or like when I go yeah. to a rise or when I pastor a church is, God, give me supernatural favor in the eyes of the people. Mm. Mm. Right? Like not just David's charm or David's affability or David's mm -hmm. kindness or friendliness or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Father, give me as an instrument for good in your hands, supernatural favor in the eyes of the people. And God very often does that. And that's mm -hmm. what's happening here. Clearly, this is more than just Ezra's erudition and charm. God has, has favorably disposed Artaxerxes to Ezra. And Ezra then uses that. He leverages what he knows is God's favor. And he starts saying, look, we need to get back. We need to rebuild the wall. We need to continue to rebuild the city. And Artaxerxes is like, yeah, yeah. I think that this is the right thing. Well, and the, the amazing part of it is that it's almost like he's supporting, in some sense, what, what Ezra is teaching. And it's almost like he believes in Ezra's God and then is mm. pouring state resources Correct. into the building of a religion. And I Correct. wanted to mention this, if Please. you don't mind, of course. is that there's a big difference between separation of church and state, which we love, and separation of God and government, which we don't love. Okay. Because we want to explain see, that distinction. Well, I want you to explain it because I think you really do well at this. And I've mm. heard you talk about it. It's like, okay, separation of church and state is there is no state religion, essentially. Correct. So yep. there's there's two prongs to the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights. It's government makes no law respecting the um, establishment, the establishment of or preventing the free exercise. So as Adventists, of course, we really love that per first prong yeah. because we say we don't want a state religion. Right. Because that would we don't want know, a state militate church. against our Sabbath and so forth. And so we're very protective of our Sabbath. And the and history of, of the yeah. world is littered with the, the blood churches. and sweat and tears of people that were persecuted by a yeah. union, an yeah. impious union of church and state. But the second prong is not preventing the free exercise. And so sometimes right. I feel like we as Adventists aren't as concerned about that. But mm. we need to be looking for opportunities like this. I was reading this and I was thinking Barry Black. You know, there he is in the halls of power, mm. and the man has had a spiritual influence within that community yes. for years. Yes. And and I want to see more of that. You mm. know, I want to see God move. And and that's effectively what's happening here is Artaxerxes is like, I like your religion. Your God is real. Here's a bunch of state resources. Go, you do you. Go do it. Yeah. So let me just say something about that. We actually touched on this briefly in the chapters on Daniel 3 and Daniel 6. Where in both cases, in Daniel 3, remember after Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come out of the fire, Nebuchadnezzar overshoots the mark, but he does say, the only God that could deliver like this must be the one true God, the That's real right. God. 
And then he compels everybody to worship that God. Okay, that's not okay. But it's very interesting that both there and in Daniel 6, where when Daniel comes out of the lion's den, the king is like, your God has delivered you. And then he makes this really favorable declaration That's about right. God. And then the same thing happens in Daniel 4. Mm -hmm. So so in this very book that we've been looking at, Ellen White says on at least two, maybe three occasions, that that it was right for the king. It yeah. was right for the king. And it was it was it was pleasing to God that the king made factual statements about the nature of reality, i.e., Hey, this God has come through in a way your that no God other God is, do. Your God is powerful. But but the bridge that's too far is the persecution for those that that's don't right. share the king's perspective. Yeah. And so that's the difference. And we need to... Nebuchadnezzar didn't have the Bill of Rights. Correct. <laughs> now, he overshot the mark. Yeah. But but she actually says in this very book that, that Nebuchadnezzar's announcement and his affirmation yeah. about the one true God mm -hmm. was pleasing to God. Yeah. Where we really? live in a... Yeah, she says it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? Well, that what he said, not yeah. the overshooting of the mark. Right, right, right. But that his announcement there's in Daniel a, 3 a line. and in Daniel 4, she says it was pleasing to God. That's incredible. She, we, we covered that. So, so just as a reminder here, mm -hmm. what we don't want is a state church. And we don't want, and the really easy way to keep this kind of clear in your mind, it's a little more complicated than this, but the easiest way to keep it clear in your mind is we believe that the secular government, that is to say the state government, is full well within its rights, God-given rights, and God given, God's, uh, God given responsibilities to enforce the second tablet of the law. That's right. But not the first tablet of the law. That not the first four commandments, which have to do with our vertical relationship. Right. But horizontal relationships, totally fine. Mm -hmm. That's why it drives me crazy when people say, You can't legislate morality. You can't legislate morality. Like, what are you what? talking about? <laughs> of course we legislate morality. We, yeah. Stealing is illegal. Kidnapping is illegal. Murder is illegal. And those are all moral Those are all issues. moral positions that are clearly articulated in the right. Ten Commandments right. and in the larger law of Moses. Yeah. So, yes, we can legislate morality. Of course we can. Hmm. What can, and we must, otherwise, yeah. what, do we have anarchy? But yeah. what we cannot do, and what's a bridge too far, is to legislate someone's individual conscience Worship. in their... Mm -hmm. vertical relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And that's the key distinction. Mm -hmm. That's the key distinction. Jen, thank you so much Beautiful. for bringing that up. Beautiful, yeah. Okay, so um, I'm turning the page now. I'm over on page 580. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot that could be said here, but if you wouldn't mind, Jen, yeah. could I put you on the spot to read The Efforts of Ezra to Revive? Okay, well, I don't have the same pagination you do, but not uh, Let's see, go up, go up, go up, keep going, keep going. Okay. Uh -huh. Keep going. No, I don't think we're that. Right there. Oh, there. Top okay. of the page. The efforts of Ezra to revive an interest in the study of the scriptures were given permanency by his painstaking lifelong work of pre preserving and multiplying the sacred. Oh, we did this book. already. Oh, we did that already. We already did this part. Okay. okay. I just really wanted to emphasize that part that he's basically yeah. a publisher. Yeah, exactly. Right? He's, he's, he's publishing the, word the word. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, Moving right along then, is there anything else, Jen, in that paragraph or in the next few paragraphs that really leapt out to you, that you uh, loved? I, I loved that they called they were called the children of the dispersion. I, I just thought that was beautiful. Mm. Um, Do you say diaspora or diaspora? I don't know. Okay. Diaspora is usually Dias I like diaspora. Yeah. It sounds yeah. really good to me. That word means the dispersion. So when the Jews were scattered. That's Ellen White's word. She uses that word yeah. a lot in reference to the Assyrians and then taken captive by the Babylonians. That's called the diaspora or the diaspora or the diaspora. It means the dispersion, right? So now what God is doing is he's taking these people that have been dispersed and he's he's gathering, gathering them back. back together. And already 50,000 have gone. There have been other smaller yeah. groups that have gone. And Ezra's on fire when he sees these favorable providential openings by the king, he's like, man, people are going to see this. They're going to sense it. They're going to feel it. And so he yeah. sends out the word that we're going to be camped at this certain spot for the next three like days. three days. We're going to get all of our stuff ready to go. But there were fewer people. And we're going to go. Yeah. And he thinks, yeah. you know, like, like the classic evangelist, he's it. like, man, it's the gonna tent's going to be full. People. There's going to be people are going to be waiting in lines to get in here. It's going to be like the iPhone 16 or whatever exactly. we're on now. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. But he's actually... Kind of disappointed because kind of not a big turnout. Not a Why wasn't turnout. there a big turnout, Jim? Because people value security more than they value freedom. I mean, look what Ooh, happens. Say it again. Yes, say it again. People, people value, value security more than they value freedom. So look at some of the things that have happened in our world, uh, maybe even recently, where people were so worried about 
a pandemic. I mean, COVID. For example, I mean, justifiably, especially that, early that on. Some of like, them were, or what about? Everybody's going to die. All right, but take a little less hot button issue. What about terrorism? About ten, right. you know, six yep. or eight years ago, people were willing to sacrifice some of their deeply cherished freedoms, freedoms. for the sake of security. And right. so, what I find, there are a few people that value freedom over security, but I think the masses tend in the other direction. Right. I think I you're would exactly say that right. That's true. Yeah. So, so what's happening is, is that many people over now approaching a century have been in Babylon. Yeah. They have assimilated to that culture, and they're doing great. They're loving it. I mean, yeah. God had said to them through Jeremiah. Remember, when you go there, build houses, plant vineyards, pray for the peace of the yeah. of the city. Like mm -hmm. they have settled in. But God had always said that at the end of seventy years, I will end your captivity. Mm -hmm. The seventy years is up, well up yeah. now. Yeah. And. Why it's time to go back. You have this like within, ringing yeah. endorsement from Artaxerxes. Here's the resources. Here's the divine, uh, here's a royal uh, protection. Go. And they're like, uh, we're kind of uh, good here. And then you I'm kind of comfortable. That there were no priests. That, well, that's, that's the kicker. That's the shocker, isn't That's it? the kicker. Oh. I mean, they go through and they start sort of, you know, itemizing, okay, who's from this family? Who's from this family? Who do we have? None. And when they she canvas says, the inventory of people that are ready to return, there are zero None priests. of the sons of Levi. None of them. Which you can just imagine how that would have utterly melted, saddened, discouraged oh. the heart of Ezra, who remembers having this revival, this experience, because he's yeah. he's in the, the crucible, so to speak, with the king. He's having yeah. those conversations. And he's, he's like, like, oh, my brethren gonna are going to be so excited about this, and they're just going to be as on fire as I am. And then none, Nobody turns none up. of the sons of Levi. And even the numbers of people that did turn up were disappointingly small, Yes, she says. So then what he does... Oh, I just can't imagine how disappointed he was. Can you just feel that? Oh, me? I can feel it. It's, oh. it's devastating. Yeah. So I think what happens then, well, let me back up here a little bit. The temptation would have been there to have just written these stiff-necked. I was going to say the same thing. Just to write them off. Like, I would just have been peace out. so tempted to shame them to oblivion. Right. But that's not what he but does. But he doesn't. What does he do? He asks them again. Again. I love this. This and, is not me, by the way. Yeah, exactly. I would be like, these ungrateful, unaware, yeah. unrepentant, stiff-necked, uncircumcised, right? I just Heart and down ears. <laughs> but, but he's like, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. They don't understand the moment. But they'd also they'd also seen the whole thing. She mentions the whole thing with Ezra, with um, Esther right. playing out. Right. So they knew that Persia was going to get a little less safe for right. them. Correct, correct. Possibly in the near future. And also they there was a great need for clergy in Jerusalem because right. they had rebuilt the they temple. They rebuilt the temple and, so and they needed to teach these, people. And, and so th there was a lot going on that should have moved them in that direction, but correct. it didn't. Yeah. It didn't. But, but you're right. He doesn't shame them. He doesn't just rebuke them. Uh, you know, there's so much um, rebuke going on in the world these days, especially because of social media. And it's as if people get some kind of supreme satisfaction out of it. Mm. And, and I'm led to ask, you know, what what do you really end up with when you tell a person off? I mean, imagine. What do you really end up, you know, you see videos, so-and-so owns someone. Well, where, what do you really get out of right. that in the end? He would have lost everything. Correct. If he had been willing to settle for simply owning them, which they deserved to be owned Beautiful. on so many levels. But instead, he asks again. He was an encourager and he was an edifier and he was there this is true leadership is what it is. It, like, it's this servant is leadership. True servant leadership. He asks again. He implores again. He reach out to, reaches out to some of his own personal friends and says, hey, look, come on, really? Yeah. We're out of here. And it's not going to... I know you think you're happy and you're safe and everything's great here, but we've seen what happened with Esther and... Mm -hmm. uh, what was that guy's name? Mordecai at the gate. What was the bad guy's Haman. name? Haman. Haman, the Agagite. Like... Uh, this isn't going to be safe either. And God is calling. God has opened doors. And then the people, she says, some were in flux. Yeah. This is a lesson for us. Yes. It's a lesson I, for I us. I noticed the same thing. When, when people are like, ah, but we might not read that they almost came. And if we write them off, then they write us off and all is lost. Yeah. But when he reaches back out again in empathy, in encouragement, mm -hmm. in edification, they're like, you know what? You're right. We're going to go. And then every, it's win-win. It was a, t a tipping of the scales. It was like a tri tipping point. It's a giant win, and that win, it was win. it really all uh, sort of rotated around the patience and servant she actually, leadership. I, doesn't she use the phrase the infinite patience? Does she? Is she either uses that in this chapter or in the next chapter? She's like the infinite patience. I was like, well, 
There you have it. That's that's one of the reasons I said he was like Moses, right? The he infinite is, patience. I just have a real respect. Type in the word infinite. Yeah, it's not in here. Okay, it's in the next chapter then. Yeah. I'll point it out in the next chapter. Um, okay, so I want to jump over. I'm going to go quite a ways ahead. And this is where the king offers the uh, royal guards and soldiers to accompany them so that they won't, because they're bringing treasures yeah. back from the temple. And they're kind of like a stagecoach in the Wild West, you know, like, you yeah. know that this money's being transferred via Wells Fargo, you know, yeah. some, and and here come the bandits riding yeah. out of the hills. And <laughs> and so he's like, look, they'll like take care of you. They're sitting ducks. They're sitting ducks. Yeah, exactly. But but Ezra feels strongly impressed that it will be a witness. His primary thing yeah, is, is to be a witnessing. witness. And it's interesting because Nehemiah actually asked for military reinforcements. So it's a little different tack. Yeah. But, he, and, and you have to let the Holy Spirit lead you. According to your circumstances. Exactly right. Yeah. Not all circumstances yeah. are the same. Yeah. This is not saying that under every single situation, this is the right way to proceed. But under this situation with yeah. this king in these circumstances, yeah. the Spirit of God impressed Ezra and he said, you know what? We're not going to take that. We're not going to take Thank you. Thank you. We want to see God work. But our faith is in God. And the king would have been like, man, this guy really believes. He really believes in this guy. Let's read that paragraph. Uh, jumping ahead to page, looks like 616 of the original 584. Paragraph begins, in this matter. In this matter, Ezra. Why don't you read that for us, Jen? Okay. In this matter, Ezra and his companions saw an opportunity to magnify the name of God now. before the heathen. Faith in the power of the living God would be strengthened if the Israelites themselves should now reveal implicit faith in their divine leader. They therefore determined to put their trust wholly in him. Come on. They would ask for no guard of soldiers. They would give the, this, they would give the heathen no occasion to ascribe to the strength of man the glory that belongs to God alone. Woo! They could not afford to arouse in the minds of their heathen friends one doubt as to the sincerity of their dependence on God as his people. Strength would be gained, not through wealth, not through the power and influence of an idolatr of idolatrous men, but through the favor of God. Mm. Only by keeping the law of the Lord before them and striving to obey it would they be protected. Uh, that's, that's, that's my favorite paragraph in this it's chapter. Incredible. It's incredible. Yeah. You know, because the idea here is evangelistic. Yeah. This is the great thing about Ezra, as we've said mm -hmm. already. He's a scholar, he's erudite, he's learned, but he's an evangelist at heart. He's also an on fire man. He's, he's on fire. Completely surrendered to God. And yeah. and he's not, I mean, we'll get to this when we talk about Nehemiah. Nehemiah is also a godly, wonderful, spirit filled man, a little more maybe hot headed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and intense. I say that, I say that with intense. Where you say that Ezra's, relating to it. I can relate to it. <laughs> Ezra's very measured, mm -hmm. very measured mm -hmm. and I think he's a great synthesis of Daniel, of Moses. We don't hear enough sermons about Ezra. We don't. We don't. I came to really love and respect him through these two chapters. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Do you have anything more you'd like to say about the chapter itself before we get to the rubric? Um, no, I think I'm good. I okay. think we need to move on. Let's go to the rubric then. This is a great chapter, an encouraging chapter. Yeah. So let's go to our rubric, the point, the person, the prayer, the practice, and the promise. Yes. Uh, Jen, for you, what was the point of this chapter? God influences powerful men to release and empower called men to called men to do a great work of rebuilding great nations. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Well said. It's yeah. like you're a writer or something. <laughs> How many books have you written, Jen? 15, I think. 16. 15? I don't remember. I lost count. Oh, good for you. I wrote, God, here, uh, God uses men and women who are committed to him to accomplish meaningful things in the world and to be godly examples to others. Beautiful. Okay, what do we learn about God? What about the person of God? Just how so he's so long-suffering and patient. I mean, just that that little point in time where Ezra could have just slammed them, mm. and he instead took a deep breath. There you go. And used persuasion. He didn't send the email. He, <laughs> he, he did, didn't send the didn't email. He send. didn't send the text. <laughs> he didn't hit send. He breathed. He paced himself, he prayed, and he, he reached again, out again. And he used persuasion. And that is our God, David. Thank you, Jesus. Because he used That's a his, great point. Yeah. Yeah. Ezra yeah. here stands in the very same position and posture mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. God to the people. Mm -hmm. yes. Great point. That's why he's so much like Moses. Mm -hmm. um, okay, here's what I wrote. God is the opener of doors, mm -hmm. but it is our role and responsibility to walk through them. 
Mm. Right? God has opened up this providential door with Artaxerxes, with the favorable uh, disposition yeah. Yeah. that he has toward Ezra. So the door is open. Yeah. And, and Ezra imagines, incorrectly at first, that people are just going to race through that open door. And he's yeah. a little, like, disheartened and discouraged when people don't. So when God opens doors, friends, we got to walk through them. Let's walk through them. Let's not be those people that stay back, even though they did finally no, we're come. We're comfortable in Babylon. Babylon's yeah. fine. Now, Babylon's not safe. This yeah. is why when you get to the book of Revelation, the great cry is, come out of her, her my Babylon. people. That is to say, come out of Babylon. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be comfortable mm -hmm. in this world that is not really our home. Mm -hmm. How do we pray this chapter, Jen? God, make me willing to be part of the fulfillment of your prophetic dreams for your people. Carry me Ooh. through, carry me through, and vanquish my enemies. That was so good. Say yeah. the first part again. God, make me willing to be part of the fulfillment of your prophetic dreams for your people. Carry me through and vanquish my enemies. I love the idea of God's prophetic dreams for his people. That's oh, beautiful, yeah. Jen. You're yeah. a great writer. <laughs> God, give me a heart for you, for your work, and for your people mm. like Ezra mm. of old mm. had. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. Uh, how do we practice this chapter? When people let you down, ask them again. <laughs> Appeal to them rather than condemning and that's shaming so good. them. That's <laughs> such, to me, that's, that's the thing so that jumps good. out. That is so good. And, and I'm taking it to heart, you know, because I like to write those emails and poison right. pen letters and stuff. Right. I get just as much out of them as anyone. But ask them again. Appeal to them, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Be winsome, not a giant jerk. Mm-hmm. Even if you think you have the moral high ground. Yeah. In fact, if you think you have the moral high ground, it's all the more reason to be patient. That's because right. the people are sometimes blind. They're ignorant. That's they don't right. see what you see. They don't know what you know. And if you appeal, there's people that are in the valley of decision that might come across that if you wrote that scathing email, if you said that scathing rebuke, it mm -hmm. might seal them off forever. And there is a place for confronting sin. Of course it, there rebuke is. Rebuke is a, is a Christian mode of communication. So there's a place for it. But we need the wisdom of the Spirit to know That's when right. this and when That's this. Right. This is Jude, right. right? Of okay. some, take compassion, making a difference. That's right. Others pull with fear out of the fire, hating even the garment, garment spotted by the flesh. By the flesh yeah. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> How do we practice? Oh, yeah. You, that was your practice. This I put here, prepare your heart, because it says twice that Ezra prepared his heart. Ezra mm -hmm. prepared his heart. Mm -hmm. Let God pour into your heart yeah. through a study of the word. And then pour into others that's by right. word and by example. Beautiful, David. Right. That's beautiful. So open your heart. Let it's God pour into you. Kind then of you pour Romans, into others. Romans 5, 5. The love of God is poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Given to us. So okay. we can then pour to other people. Jen, what's the promise here? The hand of our God is upon all of them for good that seek him, but his power and his wrath is against all of them that forsake him. Ezra 8, 22. Ooh. And I want to say this, that um, I think that there is a purpose for all of the biblical data on God's anger. Mm. I know we're kind of allergic to that um, that topic these days, but I think that there is a lot of comfort in the teaching of God's wrath and anger for particularly for people that have been victims of inhumanity or abuse. Mm. Knowing and, and I do this when I when I counsel victims because a lot of times when people have been gravely wounded by another human being, they dissociate from it. They stuff the feel they, they don't really have a, a normal emotional response to it because the emotions are so overwhelming. So mm. part of their therapy process is to actually feel the appropriate feelings given the outrage of the situation. So what I often do when I'm counseling someone who's been through something like that and they don't seem to be registering the anger and outrage that they should have is I'll say, well, that makes me angry. And I think that that's going on in scripture. When we see God getting really angry, we realize that, how- That gives them permission to be angry at something that they should be angry at. That they about. should be angry at. Yeah, exactly. So when we see God getting angry in scripture, it's a reminder to us of what really is outrageous and wrong. And it's particularly comforting, I think, to those- That's beautiful. Who've been hurt and who feel, you know, violated or vulnerable to being violated. So- Fantastic. Yeah. That's a great promise. That was Ezra- Yeah, Ezra 8.22. Um, I had several. Yeah. Um, I got 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, which says, And the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will be able to, who will be also qualified to teach others. Mm -hmm. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Mm -hmm. Then we've got 1 Timothy 4.12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech and conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. And then 1 Peter... 2 21 
which also has the word example in it, which I really like here because she uses the word example a couple times, and I like that. Mm -hmm. It says here, speaking of Jesus as our example, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Ezra's life was a difficult life. Like it was not easy to bear with the people just mm -hmm. as Moses' life, mm -hmm. but that's the example that has been left us mm -hmm. by God himself in the flesh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Jen, we come now to our word, and let's see. My word is desire, says 303 Syzygy. Mm -hmm. The Israelites and Levites didn't have a desire to leave Persia, mm -hmm. but it was Ezra's desire and God's desire. Very mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. Coral says mouthpiece. Arlene says trust or trusted. Mm -hmm. I like mouthpiece. That's good. Yeah, very good. Braden says return. return. Susanna says hand. And Herbal, er, uh, Herbal Addy says perseverance. perseverance. Safety. Safety not in man, but safe in God. Another mouthpiece. I Prepared. Like mouthpiece, yeah. Study. Mm -hmm. Earnest. Revive. Revive is great because she uses the word several times, and it's right in the chapter, right? In the yeah. next chapter, yeah. revival. Yeah. Uh, teacher, says Reiner. Teacher. Stirred, mm -hmm. Ezra's and God's desire was for them to leave. A very good, 303 Syzygy. Uh, trusted, purposed, Ezra purposed mm -hmm. his life. Very mm -hmm. good. Home, magnified. Oh, that's yeah. good. Dashy yeah. dash 707. Excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, precedent, harmony or instrument, says Hannah. Very good. Favor, Favor. Leave. leave. Mouthpiece, says Stefan. Yeah, a lot of people are saying yeah, mouthpiece. mouthpiece. Yeah, mouthpiece. Friendship. Oh, friendship's really friendship good. Is good. Yeah. Really good. good. Law, godly, example, example. Appeal. See, I like the word example, but I couldn't use it because I already used it back in like chapter oh, three. Okay. And I don't like to reuse words. Oh. Loyalty, purposed, heart. Ezra endeavored to gain a heart preparation. Very good. Trusted, says Deb Snyder. Friend, again. I want to say Experience. made it. Oh, that's hot. Experience. That's a phrase. We could take mm -hmm. a phrase. Mm -hmm. Experience, learner. Friends. Friends, yeah. Five Carsons, oh five. Very good. Jen, what was your word? Well, I you know I had three. I'm not allowed to do that, right? <laughs> well, Stefan does it every single he time. He does it every time. Yeah, every time. So dispersion, I I like, but it doesn't really summarize the chapter. Okay. And then um, heated is another one that I liked. You know, heated like yeah. that surrender, that dependence. Mm. But I think hand. That was mine. Hand. Hand. Why hand? Because the hand of God. Oh, very good. Yeah. Very good. But the I hand think I of like God. mouthpiece too. I think that's a really good thing. Yeah, mouthpiece is really yeah. good. Yeah. Out to sure. chat says, my word was restrained. The people restrained from going to Ezra, uh, mm -hmm. but Ezra convinced them. Ezra restrained from armed security. Very good. God mm -hmm. restrained the heathen from attacking them. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Hannah says you're allowed to have three words. <laughs> Thank you. Only Stefan can have three words. That's correct, <laughs> Sierra Hiker. That's the dispensation. For some reason, we give Stefan... He a gets, dispensation. He gets three words, but nobody gets, else does. He gets extra words just because he's defined. Um, I went with the word providence. Yeah, that's good. Providence, because that opening paragraph there, yeah. the remarkable providence. And Ezra himself was a and providence. You've never used providence. I haven't yet. Not in this. Uh, not in this book. Mm -hmm. Ezra himself was a providence, right? Mm -hmm. That God would raise up mm -hmm. at just the right time, because you not only needed the heart of the king to be soft. You needed a godly, scholarly, erudite, evangelistically a, savvy man that would be in that space. And a guy who had the talent, really, to command respect from a heathen Correct. king, you know? Correct. He had to be especially gifted and endowed, and God, you know, raised him up and actuated him, and yeah. he was able to win the affections of a powerful monarch. Yeah. I, to yeah. be clear, I probably would have gone with the word example. My promises yeah. had the word example in them. Yeah. But I'd already used it back in chapter three, and I don't think I've ever duplicated a word. But I also really liked the word providence because it just feels like that's what's going on here. This yeah, is providential. Is. The decree was providential. Uh, Artaxerxes' favorable disposition to the Jews and to Ezra was providential. Ezra's own passion for the word and mm -hmm. passion for ministry and passion mm -hmm. for people was providential. Like it all mm -hmm. feels like, and the fact that it, things were going to get less and less safe in Medo Persia mm -hmm. is like providential. It's like, hey, it's. It's time to go. Mm -hmm. And when God opens up those doors, providentially, our responsibility, God can't walk through the doors for us. That's right. We walk through the doors, he opens them. Mm -hmm. So that was a great chapter. Uh, let's get now right into chapter 51. Let's waste no time. <laughs> chapter 51 is a spiritual revival. Really, this is like part two. Yeah. Right? This is this is part two of the very chapter that, you know, that follows on. I mean, this is what happens when Ezra arrives in Jerusalem. 
and they get there and a, a revival breaks out in part because of the amazing example of those that came back with Ezra because they arrive and the people are like, what? There's no royal guard. Where are the soldiers? Yeah. And they're like, we didn't trust in the Medo-Persian soldiers. Mm -hmm. We didn't trust in the guards. Mm -hmm. We trusted in God. Yahweh. <laughs> and we learned so much along the way. And this often happens in churches. It's one of the things that happens with the Arise program, right? Like these people come to the Arise program. We get 40 or 50 students. And then when they go back to their local churches or they're assigned to churches as Bible workers, they come in, they're on fire, they're mm -hmm. passionate. They've been knocking on doors. They've got all this ministry experience like in them. I've just mm -hmm. seen this happen for the last 20 plus years. And they get into these churches that are, yeah. they're, they're, they're good churches with, <laughs> with good, good people, people, but they need a spark. But they've gone to sleep. They've gone to sleep. And when the spark shows up, they're like, hey, wait a minute. Our God's alive. Our God is a living God. God is yeah, let's do something. <laughs> and I've seen it over and over again mm -hmm. where this catalyzing effect of people that have been there, done yeah. that with Jesus can start to create a sort of cascade of, oh, hey, well, hey, I want into it. Oh, yeah, me too. Oh, you're yeah. going to go knock on doors? Let me go. Oh, you're going to, I want. And it's then like all the of a sudden. the church just senses that there's a revival happening. Exactly. And they jump on and, and ride the way. And this chapter is called A Spiritual Revival. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so let's just start by reading that first paragraph there, Jen, if you don't sure. mind. Ezra's arrival in Jerusalem was opportune. There was great need of the influence of his presence. His coming brought courage and hope to the hearts of many who had long labored under difficulties. Mm. Since the return of the first company of exiles under the leadership of Zerubbabel and Joshua, over 70 years before, much had been accomplished. The temple had been finished and the walls of the city had been partially repaired. Yet much remained undone. Incredible. Mm. So, so we're now, we have the first 70 years, which was the 70 years of captivity that was uh, prophesied by Jeremiah. And what she's saying here is this is now another 70 years after that. Mm. So we're like 140 years after the original captivity that took place with Nebuchadnezzar mm. coming to Jerusalem. So, so these people are late to the party, so yeah. to speak. But when they get there, their influence, their energy, their passion, mm. it was just the right time. And again, this is providential. And you, so you don't have to rely on novelty because this whole process of rebuilding Jerusalem had been very protracted. And, you know, we have churches and, and people will say, well, the church has been around for a certain, you just kind of have to just pronounce it dead. No. Yeah, churches can't come back when no. they get to a certain level, but that's not the case. It's not true. This has been churches a very can be revived. Point. Yes, exactly. And, and, and mm -hmm. we sometimes think, oh, the church, like as if something in the building mm -hmm. and in the walls and in the carpet is somehow like immune or inoculated against revival. That's yeah. not how it works. Yeah. No, you just need to you just need to get people in there that are mm -hmm. like, hey, wait a minute, Ezra people, people like Ezra mm -hmm. and Nehemiah and Haggai and Zechariah and Zerubbabel, you get in there and say, hey, wait a minute, we can do something here. Let's do something. Uh, I'm gonna read the next couple paragraphs as well. Among those who had returned to Jerusalem in former years, there were many who had remained true to God as long as they lived, but a considerable number of the children and the children's children lost sight of the sacredness of God's law. Even some of the men entrusted with responsibilities were living in open sin. And we'll see that that's intermarriage mm -hmm. with the surrounding nations. Mm -hmm. Their course was largely neutralizing the efforts made by others to advance the cause of God. For so long as flagrant violations of the law were allowed to go unrebuked, the blessing of heaven could not rest upon the people. It was in the providence of God that those who returned with Ezra there it is, providence, mm -hmm. had had special seasons of seeking the Lord, the experience through which they had passed on their journey from Babylon, unprotected as they had been by any human power, had taught them rich spiritual lessons. They were like all the graduates of Arise. They were the graduates of Arise. <laughs> Many had grown strong in faith, and these mingled with the discouraged and the indifferent in Jerusalem. Their influence was a powerful factor in the reform soon afterward instituted. And I want to say this just quickly, Jen. Yeah. They're following the example of Ezra because they could arrive and they could just write these Laodiceans off. They'd be like, look at all these ladies, just like Ezra could have exactly. written them off. But they have had modeled for them. Exactly. Mm -hmm. They've had modeled for them the and godly of them, leadership of Ezra. Some of them were the very people that Ezra had been patient with. Exactly. <laughs> so Ezra's been patient with them. Yeah. They've had a rich experience. They show up and they so now they know. To, they pass along that spirit. Exactly. And so they say, no, 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 no. You, you don't have to be Laodicean. Yeah. You don't have to live in open sin. You don't have to be discouraged or depressed. Let me show you. And, the, and they see revival mm -hmm. is always like the fire that starts and then it grows and then it grows and then it grows. 
Before you know it, revival kind of takes on a life of its own. That's what I mean by this cascading effect. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's what happens here. Mm -hmm. This incredible cascading effect takes place, and that's the way it happens in churches. People are like, oh, my church is dead. Well, are you dead? Well, no, I'm not dead. Is everybody dead? Well, no, actually, my friend. Okay, well, start with the small group. You know, get your yeah. people. Start praying. Start working. Become greeters. And bring in one. And bring in two. And bring in three. And before you know it, you reach that critical mass where <clears throat> the whole church. So what if, though, there is an I and yes and amen and, not but, but and. And. If there is a stronghold where the leadership, the existing leadership is preventing the people from growing, because you kind of see that here in this story. That does happen. And there's some egregious wrongs going on that are actually part of the reason that this backsliding right. has taken place. Yeah, that's exactly so right. So sometimes there has to be a calling out process. Yeah, yeah. It's not, yeah. revival doesn't always come only as a result of encouragement and patience. Sometimes yeah. revival comes as a result of discipline. Shaking things and up. And you got to shake things up, right? Like, yeah. like. Church discipline is actually very often a precursor to revival. That's right. It's like, a, a, I've told this story before, but I'll just quickly, I'll give the short version of it. You know, Nathan, my, our good friend Nathan Renner, pastored a church one time and an evangelist said to him after holding an evangelistic meeting in one of his churches, he said, that church is one funeral short of a revival. Yeah, there's right? someone because there. Because someone's there. It's got a stranglehold on the church. Yeah. And sometimes you need a funeral. Sometimes you need a yeah. disfellowshipment. Yeah. Sometimes... There are obstacles and people in the way. And sometimes, this is the best case scenario, you just need repentance. Yeah, everybody needs to repent. You just repent yeah. and you find your feet again. And that's what happens here. Yeah. Under the influence of Ezra's godly leadership, it's found out that there has been a, a an epidemic that's right. of intermarrying. And, and Ezra knows, because he's erudite, because he's a scholar, yeah. he knows that this, oh, this is exactly how we ended up in this position because yeah. then you get a blurring of the lines between yeah. us and them. Yeah. Their gods and our gods. I mean, this goes back to Solomon. That's right. It's like, uh, that's not the way. And they basically annul. He was able to trace it back to its source. Exactly. Yeah. So they're like, um, no, we're really sorry. But all of these marriages are no longer marriages. So I want to say something before you get to yeah, yeah. how he deals with the people yeah. that were in these uh, marriages. I have a note here. It says open sin in pastors is dealt with differently than sin in congregants. And I want to quote 1 Timothy 5.19. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist, persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that the rest may stand in fear. So there's like a public nature to calling out a pastor who's right. living or a spiritual leader who's living in open sin. Correct. And these many of these people were, were. spiritual leaders. I mean, she makes That's that right. point repeatedly. That's right. That's right. And, you know, we see we have actually have a, a living example of this in the book of Galatians where Paul That's right. calls out Peter mm -hmm. in Galatians 2. Like he tells us, like in Antioch, I called him out. I withstood him to his face, Paul But there's says. also 1 Corinthians chapter 5 where there was an incestuous, a flagrant incestuous relationship in the Corinthian church. And Paul says he's furious and throughout the chapter, but he's furious with the elders that didn't do anything. Right, that's right. Because <laughs> they were dumb yeah. dogs that wouldn't bark. That's right, that's right. So can I ask a question? You can ask a question. I mean, intermarriage doesn't sound to me like that bad of a thing. So can we, can we, this is something that came to me. It's like, why? Well, because of the influence. Yeah. Exactly. Because of the idolatrous influence. And that's what happened with Solomon. And it's the history of Israel. The history of Israel is largely the history of intermingling and especially intermarrying with the various Canaanite tribes and then a blurring of the lines yeah. between you shall have no other gods before yeah. me, plainly spelled out in the Decalogue, and then these other gods. And we have these incredible passages, which we've read already in the pre-captivity chapters, where it says that they served Yahweh and worshipped their idols. Hmm. That's called syncretism, where they just sort of blended mm -hmm. together mm -hmm. this and this. And that marriage is where that starts. Mm -hmm. And and what is it about marriage? I was thinking about this, and, it, and it's the case that I think that marriage is such a close, intimate relationship. The two become one. Mm -hmm. that it's almost impossible for a person to retain their convictions, their practices. You're going to conform to some degree Correct. to your spouse. Correct. And so choose someone that maybe isn't exactly like you, but you can conform to them to some degree without compromising your values. Correct. Can two walk together That's except right. they be agreed. Exactly. We, exactly. we deal with this quite a little bit in the marriage book and then yeah. even more so, I think, in We're the dating book. We're going to in book. the dating book. That's right. Yeah, why? The, I mean, why is it important to choose some of the same belief system and same practice as you? 
Correct. It minimizes the number of conflicts for one thing, but then there is that influence factor and it led them. It was the, it was the gateway into Correct. idolatry. Exactly right. Yeah. It, it, this chapter deals a lot with the, you know, the influence. Remember, we just read that, that they came back and their influence, when they returned, their influence was providential, it was opportune, and the people began to be positively influenced by yeah. their arrival and by their enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. There's also the influence of others, leaders, who had begun to intermarry. Mm -hmm. so, so we see here this slippery slope mm -hmm. of influence. Is it yeah. flowing from me or to me? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right? That's the question we've always got to be asking in our associations with unbelievers. I know someone that teaches on marriage and she calls it flirt to convert. And I kind of understand where she's coming from and agree with her to, to a degree. If someone who is not a Christian, for example, becomes very interested in a Christian, it could be that they're being drawn to God. Mm -hmm. But you have to navigate that very carefully. Very carefully. Because, because you have to times, distinguish between their interest yeah. in you and their interest <laughs> in God. Because a lot of times when you, you know, cross the altar, then the incentive It's like, I away. got what I want, yeah, the incentive exactly. is gone. Yeah, exactly. I, I have met many couples who they will tell me that it was the husband or the wife that originally, you know, sort of uh, had created or aroused an interest in them uh, for spiritual things, for godly things, and the person navigated it well yeah. and said, okay, wait, wait, I'm open. But we got to deal with the Jesus this. thing and the Bible thing. <laughs> exactly. And this other romantic thing is going to be on hold. Okay, yeah. that's how you handle it well. But I've also seen it where it's not handled well. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, I'll marry you and everything's going to turn out fine and you're going to get converted. And, and then, then you the person doesn't get converted. And then nagging the person for, you know, or whatever. And then you're like, how come you're not converted? Well, I, yeah, that, that, that. I wasn't converted when you married me. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You don't marry who somebody could become or who you hope they'll become. You marry who they are. So men of providence had dared transgress the laws given as a safeguard against apostasy. Correct. And, and it says that his heart was stirred. And then, and then this quote, I rent my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard and sat down astonished, which That's is like astonished. overwhelmed with emotion. Yeah. He pulled his hair out and his beard out. I he, don't have a beard and I never have had one and I probably will, will never have one. I hope not. But is it hurt? I don't have enough of a beard to know, but just getting <laughs> hair pulled out, Ouch. just sometimes I pull a hair out of my ear, like it sticks out and I'm like, pull it out and it hurts like crazy. It does. And, and well, I, he's just, this is his way of expressing profound sadness and remorse. But also it's a, it's a way of, of inflicting a little bit of physical pain to get some relief from the emotional pain. Oh, that's a good point. Because that's why people cut. Oh, I like that. And oh, I'm not recommending it in any way, shape, or form, but that's what's behind it is it releases certain endorphins in your system and, and helps when numb out your emotions. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So it's like an escape yeah. almost. Yeah, exactly. Then we get this incredible prayer that he prays that is exactly like it's the incredible. prayer of Daniel. And, and it's all in the we, the us, and the our. And I was I was reading it because I've noted that in uh, Daniel chapter 9, he uses 32 inclusive pronouns. Yep. Guess how many Ezra uses? 37. Even more than Daniel. More inclusive pronouns. In my count, and I may have missed some, 37 inclusives. And the point being... This is straight out of Daniel 9, one of the most beautiful prayers in all the Bible. So what's the point of that? The inclusive pronouns, what's the point there? That it's not just them. He's it's not, not those saying, sinners. help these ridiculous lost people that I'm trying to help. Stiff-necked, uncircumcised, yeah. immoral, intermarrying, heathen. He's counting himself us, in as we, one of them. Our. He's identifying so fully with his people that he's like if effectively a high Correct. priest. Exactly he's right. Representing the people to, I, you know, God, the, a prophet represents God to the people, and a priest represents the people to God. Exactly. Yeah. Beautifully said. Yeah. Yeah. This prayer that he prays is amazing. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's Danielic. It is. It's so so good, and the people after he prays this prayer, they all weep bitterly. Many and, of those who had sinned were deeply affected. Affected. There it is with infinite patience. How does that paragraph begin? And I love this was this. the beginning of a wonderful reformation. Okay. This is the beginning of a wonderful reformation with infinite patience intact and with a careful consideration. This is page 591. Sorry, everybody. Bottom of page 591 of Types and Symbols, 623 of the original. With a careful consideration for the rights and welfare of every individual concerned. Woo! Come on now. I mean, I love this. It's, it's the servant leadership of this man is just it, shining. And it's so psychologically, emotionally sound. It, he's he's trauma-informed. He's you know? informed. He knows how to deal with people. He's he, not just a brilliant scholar and an on-fire evangelist. Because you think about it, like how difficult would it be you're married 
what do you do? Like, was it annulment or what did they, you know, it was tough. It was a mess. These and were difficult steps that were these people were being asked to take. And he but was he walking them patience. through it. I need yeah. to preach a series on the book of Ezra. Yeah, you do. I'm so convinced that I need to preach on Ezra. I mean, yeah. I'm a little embarrassed to say that in 20 plus you years haven't. of ministry, I've never preached a single sermon on Ezra the person. I've preached passages that yeah. relate to Ezra, especially the prophecies of Daniel 8 9, but it's yeah. like, this guy's amazing. He's, he is amazing, and he's not that dwelt upon. You no. Know, he's not given a lot of He's like this time. incredible synthesis of Moses yeah. and of Daniel. He is. Because Moses, incredible. he leads the people. Yeah. And Daniel, he, you know, there's, uh, it would be fun to go through and compare mm -hmm. not just the number of inclusives, but the actual content. Like, I don't, like, just break down the prayer of Daniel 9, brrr, and then break down the, in phrases. Yeah. And then break down it this prayer. It sounds so much like it's, it. I, it's crazy. Amazing. And I'm not surprised that he had infinite patience based on his prayer. The spirit and the tenor of his prayer is reflected in the fact that he worked with probably each individual situation and tried to find the best way forward. He was a he was a scribe. He was a priest. He, was, he was a judge. A therapist. He's a therapist <laughs> of a sort. I mean, what an astonishing person that he was. And and one of the things I love about this, the, the, to me, this whole and it chapter. It says that it says he gave personal attention to the examination of every, every case. case. He was a therapist. Crazy. He sought to impress. Let me just read that. He sought to impress the people with the holiness of this law and the blessings to be gained through obedience. Okay, yeah. so so I'm so glad I read that last oh, bit yeah. there. For me, this whole chapter mm -hmm. is about the law of God, the commandments of God, the scriptures, mm -hmm. the Bible. And when Ellen White gets into the practical application at the end of this, mm -hmm. she's just like, we need a revival mm -hmm. of the study of the Bible, the study of scripture, the study mm -hmm. of the prophecies. Mm -hmm. In other words, what's taking place, this is a very important point, what's taking place in Ezra's life is not just this like, he was a large-hearted, magnanimous, amazing, erudite person. That's not what's going on. What's going on is he was a vehicle and a vessel through which his intense study of the Word, mm -hmm. his intense study of, of God's mm -hmm. sacred history, mm -hmm. turned him into the kind of person that God could powerfully use. Mm -hmm. And the lesson is we need to be students of the Word mm -hmm. so that we can be those vehicles and vessels through which God's favor can flow to those around us. Mm. That's this chapter. Mm. That's what it's really about. It's mm. all about mm -hmm. the study of the word and the infilling in our lives with a knowledge of who God is in scripture. And see, especially today where we're talking so much about deconstruction, deconstruction at its best is people deconstructing the errors that they have learned through religion. Right. And Babylon that, has fallen, has fallen. But what it so often leads to is deconstruction of faith entirely. So I think there needs to be a deconstruction of the fallenness of Babylon and what, how we were misinformed about God. Correct. But then a reconstruction. God is not a control of, freak. Eternal conscious torment is not true. Right, exactly. God does not predestine everybody's every action, thought, and word. Okay, let's right. deconstruct these orthodox Christian ideas that have accumulated through, you know, the papal the and medieval periods. Fine. But then what some people want to do is they want to deconstruct the whole and thing. They, they reject the Bible with And they the think they're Lewis and Clark, you know, right out on the frontier yes. of, so of edgy. finding the truth. But actually they're You've they're nothing. not progressive, they're regressive. That's right. And they're transgressive. It's easy to react to bad things, but to ask the Lord to lead you to something better. Correct. That takes the Holy Spirit. You can't throw yeah. the baby out with the bathwater is the old saying. So do deconstruct, but also reconstruct. Yeah, you're not faith deconstructing structures. faith. You're deconstructing bad religion. That's right. That's and that's right. what's taking place here. He's deconstructing yeah. bad religion. That's right. That's and right. And I just love that attention to every case, each individual. Yes. This beautiful, inclusive prayer. I mean, not only was Ezra's IQ astonishingly high, no doubt. His yeah. EQ. Yeah. Yeah. Must have been extremely high. He was. Sensitive, We've already had many evidences of his tactful, very high EQ. Yeah, and, the way and, he dealt with the king, the way he dealt with those that didn't want to come at first. It's actually good news, isn't it, David, that people can have a very, very, very high IQ and yep. also have a high EQ. Thank you, Jesus. These are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> it's not a zero sum game. <laughs> wherever, uh, bottom of page five ninety one. Wherever, that was for you, by the way. <laughs> you're such a sweetie. <laughs> wherever Ezra labored. They're spraying up a revival. Mm. The study of the Holy Scriptures. That's mm. my point. Teachers were appointed to instruct the people. The law of the Lord was exalted and made honorable. The books of the prophets were searched, which is just another word for studied. And the passages foretelling the coming of the Messiah brought hope and comfort to many sad and weary heart. I'm going to read the next paragraph. Where More are than you? Uh, 5, 624, 592 begins. 
More than 2,000 years. Okay, got it. You got it? Mm -hmm. More than 2,000 years have passed since Ezra. Now here's where she gets into the application. Mm -hmm. Before, uh, since Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it. Yet the lapse of time is not less than the influence of his pious example. Mm -hmm. Through the centuries, the record of his life of consecration has inspired many with the determination to seek the law of the Lord and to do it. Ezra's motives were high and holy, and all that he did was actuated Right. By a deep, deep love. love for souls. Thank you, Jesus. God can teach you tact and EQ through his Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. And through the love of souls. Yeah. The compassion and tenderness that he revealed toward those who had sinned, either willfully or through ignorance, huh, mm -hmm. should be an object lesson to all who seek to bring about reforms. Mm -hmm. The servants of God are to be as firm as a rock where right principles are involved. And yet, with all, they are to manifest sympathy and forbearance. Mm -hmm. Like Ezra, they are to teach transgressors the way of life. By calculating principles that are the foundation of all right doing. There's I mean, this a is tension such there, isn't that? Great material. There's yeah. an incredible tension There's there. There's standing firm for principle and, and advancing those principles, but also dealing tactfully and carefully and lovingly. With people. With people. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of all of the... At the end of the day, we're trying to save people. We're trying to redeem yeah. people. We're trying to recapture people yeah. for the gospel, not turn them off and write them off. And that's a whole thing in counseling is like the emphasis is on empathy where you enter another person's experience and you let them know that you're, you know, right alongside of them, you're joining them in their struggle. There's a real temptation, and I'll tell you from experience, to only do that because you will procure the favor of your client right. if you just empathize pretty much. But there has to be something beyond empathy. But if you don't eventually lead them to a challenge, you're there really you not helping them restructure in a healthy way. So can yeah. you, because empathy leads to people, you need empathy, but then it yeah. leads somewhere. It leads to, what was the word you used? Restructure. Yeah. Or also engagement is what I call it. When I teach, um, when I teach coaching, I talk about empathy being the sort of the entering wedge and, and you start with empathy and then you revert back to empathy where you don't whenever you don't know what to do, but there has Ooh, to be like a point that. where you where you engage them, where you actually challenge them. Mm. So you have to kind of toggle between those two things or you're not gonna truly help people. And the hard part about that is, just speaking as a counselor, is some people don't want to be challenged. They want they're, only empathy. They're paying you to just listen. And so you can do it, and but mm. it's, it's very difficult. It's hard on me as a counselor because I wanna see people actually Get Grow. better. Exactly. Growth exactly. mindset. Yes. So then you end up in the, the last sort of three and a half oh, pages there's, here. Is, yeah. There's just so many great oh. lines in Can here. And it's well? all practical application. Yes, of yeah. course. This is incredible. This sentence. The whole system of religious principles and doctrines, mm. which should form the foundation and framework of social life. Social life. In other words, all of our relationships are you flow built on out the of, great truth of scripture out, exactly are built upon the great truths of scripture seem to be a tottering mass ready to fall in ruins look at you wrote wow look what i wrote right by that oh we both we both right by the wow. very same thing we both wrote wow that's so cool that is first of all that's great writing can yeah. we just stop for a moment and it's say crazy. that's fantastically it's great crazy. writing and right. it's also so true that that that's what it looked like. It looked like the whole thing was about ready to fall apart. And frankly, that kind of sounds like 2024, right? It kind of sounds like we're, the about, whole, ready we're about ready to just totter into oblivion. That's right. With many of these, again, pro so-called progressive ideas that are actually both regressive and transgressive. So I loved her phrase, um, social life. So forms the framework for social life. And so I identified a few things that I think she This is top of page 593. So Four types and symbols, 625, paragraph begins with the setting aside of the Bible. It's the very last line in that paragraph. In other words, the social life is how human beings relate to one another. So some of the things that are bound up in that, in my thinking, that are being challenged in today's mm. world are male-female distinction. Okay. Okay. Um, the sanctity of life. Come on the now. Sac the sacredness of marriage. The value of the nuclear family. Thank you, Jesus. The Come oneness on. of all races. Thank you. What I would call common grace, which is the ability to bring the principles of the gospel into your interactions with people, rather than resorting very quickly to division and 
polarization and mm. enmity. You're going to just reach across. How do we build not break? Things. Exactly, exactly. Common. This could be called common grace and forgiveness, bringing forgiveness into our daily interactions with other human beings. Those are just some things Ooh. that I thought were ways in which the doctrines of the Bible actually impact social life. There's that continuum. No, you, that's, that's yeah. extremely accurate. And, you know, sometimes, and I know that I'm not alone in this, uh, and this is not something that's unique to Christians, but mm -hmm. I think it's happening a lot with Christians, is you sometimes wake up, you read a headline, mm -hmm. and it hits you. You're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. What? Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> what? This really happened? It, like, the world is falling apart, apart. around <laughs> us, and, and not in the ways that it was even 30 years ago. It's yeah. like things that we have just taken to be so totally solid mm. and grounded and mm. immovable, mm. all of us, every, you know, back to the deconstructionist view mm -hmm. and the materialist view, the physicalist view, the atheist view, mm -hmm. the pluralist view. It's like things that are absolutely uniformly and mm. clearly mm. positives. Yeah. It's like, no, those aren't positives. Those are actually negatives. The this is nuclear, what we're being told. The nuclear, the nuclear family, family as as and marriage. It's as, a form of oppression. I mean, every civilization that has ever existed, every every positive winning civilization that has ever existed in the history of the human experience has had it has been built by families that are the small units, the bricks That's right. that make up the larger society. And to the That's degree right. that those bricks are strong, the building is strong. That's but right. now we're in a place where we're like, no, 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 we don't need no, that brick. We don't need that. It's, we it's, can fact, build with... It's not that we don't need it. It's, it's downright oppressive. It's actually bad. Yeah, yeah. You, you can't be faithful to one woman. Yeah. You can't be faithful to one man. You're not wired that way. You're an evolutionary animal. Yeah. In fact, it's not in your best interest or the best interest of the other or the best interest of your children. No, you should be open to the great new horizon of mm. polyamory mm. and multiple lovers and mm -hmm. no fault divorce. And mm -hmm. it's like, what? Yeah. What? Like the, the conventional wisdom of today. It's, it's like gone. Paul in Romans 1, like professing it's themselves to be wise. Yeah. They've become fools. That's right. That's so, right. so there is a strong sense in which as Christians, mm -hmm. we can be I'm going to draw a very important line here. We can be aware of the toppling mass. Tottering mass. The tottering mass that seems like it's about ready to fall over. That yeah, is. Ready to fall in ruins. The world in which we live. But yeah. but we need to remember that at the other end of all of this are people. Mm -hmm. People, human beings. Mm -hmm. So when we just make these sweeping statements about society and the situation mm -hmm. and ideologies and mm -hmm. principles that are fundamentally flawed, we have mm -hmm. to remember yeah. We need to try and do so in a way that's winning, that's mm -hmm. winsome, mm -hmm. that's gospel saturated, because we're trying, like Ezra, to woo people to the truth, not just to alienate them because they're believing lies. And many of them are believing lies. Yeah. So what's happening? Not an easy road to walk. With Christendom, is there, at least in the United States, there's been a strong contingency who have engaged in kind of the war, the culture wars is what we call them. And, and in the process of that, there's been some alienation of people that could have been one, right? Correct, yeah. exactly right. Yeah. yeah, there are people that are open and susceptible. Right, so what we're trying to do in our marriage workshop, for example, is we talk about the attack on the family from without, but right. we also talk about the attack on the family from within. Right, yeah. correct. That's very, that's I exactly I feel like the right. lights are going off. In the oh, Violetta just, she's, oh, she's, okay. She's, she's out there turning off lights. But listen, here's the, oh no, I think that light just died actually. Yeah. My little light behind us just perished. Um, the great chapter strongly encourage reading the last like three pages because the points of practical application for us is basically this. This is what Ellen White's saying in a nutshell. Study the word. Study the word. Stay in the word. Read the word. Apply the word. Memorize the word. Yeah. Like get in the scriptures. Get in the scriptures. Get in the scriptures. You want to spend some time on Instagram? Fine. Fine. There's nothing wrong with that. People are on Instagram right now. Hi. But spend time in the word. You want to watch a movie? Okay, as long as it doesn't glorify the godless things that are, you know, uh, antithetical to the Christian faith. Okay, knock yourself out. You want a little entertainment? I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But get in the word. Yeah. Don't you want to watch a basketball game? Way. Okay, fine. Get in the word. And the thing is that the social get in the media word. and the movies are and, and the sports tend to be addictive. And so be aware of that. You have to be aware of that. Yeah. Exactly right. And the celebrity culture that we're living in today where, you know, it's just this idolization of people. And, yeah. You know, people are like, oh, what is Taylor Swift wearing? I don't know. I, who cares what Taylor Swift is wearing? What's Jesus wearing? My sins, what's right? What am I wearing? Yeah. The robe of his, his righteousness. righteousness. By the way, that's not just a shot at Taylor Swift. I, whatever. I'm just saying 
the celebrity idolatrous culture in which we live today mm -hmm. is one in which we are hyper interested in things that are not of eternally uh, not of eternal significance or consequence. That's right. That's right. Get in the word. Get in the word. Get in the word. Her whole point in this chapter is revival comes through the word. Mm -hmm. Revival comes through the word. You got anything? I'll give you the last word, Jen, before we get to the rubric. Oh, with, on the, okay. Did you have anything well, there that you were like, oh, I really wanted to read that? I mean, I just love the second to last paragraph. Read it for us. The second to the last paragraph in the whole thing, the just before she quotes Joel at length. The reformers whose protest has given us the name of Protestant. Come on now. Felt that God had called them to give the light of the gospel to the world. And in the effort to do this, they were ready to sacrifice their possessions, their liberty, mm. even life itself. In the face of persecution and death, the gospel was proclaimed far and near. Amen. The word of God was carried to the people and all classes, high and low, rich and poor, learned and ignorant, eagerly studied it for it themselves. Come on now. Are we... In this last conflict of the great controversy, as faithful to our trust as the early reformers were to theirs. And I like that she just leaves that out there. Yeah. She doesn't, she's not saying no, she's just saying, are we? And this is a great opportunity for reflection mm -hmm. that, and, and the book, The Great Controversy, goes into great detail on many of these reformers, mm -hmm. Luther and Calvin and Huss and Zwingli and Melanchthon. We're going to talk about them. But, mm -hmm. The invitation here is to say mm -hmm. revival and reformation came about in the days of Ezra through the word. Mm -hmm. Revival in the Protestant Reformation came about through sola scriptura, a study of the word. And her invitation and exhortation here is get in the word. Yeah, you have other things in your life. Sure. But make sure that there's plenty of room in your life mm -hmm. for the word. Mm -hmm. This is why I love these Ooh, books these because books they're just chock full of the word. That's know? what we're doing. Yeah. We are literally immersing ourselves in these reading challenges, whether it's Patriarchs and Prophets, Desire of Ages, Steps to Christ, or Prophets and Kings, we're doing them because we are immersing ourselves in the Word. We're learning biblical history. We're learning about the prophecies. We're learning about the exhortations. We're learning. And hopefully, not just learning in some intellectual, but we're growing. And, you know, I wasn't raised learning. the. I was one of those people that I would say Moses and the Ark. You know, I just didn't really have the details in my mind. I wasn't raised with a lot of Bible stories. The Books of the Spirit of Prophecy, particularly the Conflict of the Ages series, are a ramp up to biblical literacy. Correct, hundred percent. And it's it's you know written in a very very. I'm in a continual state fashion. of reading these books, yeah. and I have been since yeah. the day I got. Yeah. Just like they say, you would never say, for example, as a Christian, I read the Bible, as if that's something that you did and you're not continuing to do. No, you're yeah. in a continual state of rereading the Bible. Yeah. I'm in a continual state of rereading. Re Patriarchs and Prophets, Prophets and Kings, Desire of Ages, Acts of the Apostles, Great Controversy, Steps to Christ, Christ Object Lessons, because these are really just explications of the text scripture. of Scripture. And yeah. we read them. Like it's when I read conflict. these two chapters, it's I also read... It's not like read... you read this and it's different than exactly. what the Scriptures say. When I read these two yeah. chapters, 50 and 51, I read the whole book of Ezra. Yeah, it's beautiful. All 10 chapters of Ezra. Because we want to have this immersive experience because... The world is coming at us from every conceivable direction, mm. whether it's entertainment, whether it's immorality, whether it's Darwinian mm -hmm. evolution. It's just, we're being attacked like crazy mm -hmm. by the world. So we need to have a insulative factor mm. that protects us from the mm -hmm. wiles of the devil, from his temptations. And that insulative factor is the spirit-led reading of the scriptures. It's very stabilizing. It, that's the that's a the great word stable yes and the scriptures are calculated to to stabilize people emotionally thank you and also to develop their intellect they're calculated Correct. to develop the mind okay so let's do our rubric okay. here jen the point the person the prayer the practice and the promise what's the point of this chapter jennifer the influence of a consecrated warrior man can turn the tide of history Woo! or woman or woman i use that you know yeah man generic. in the generic sense yes uh, these books, in fact, were written by a woman, That's which right. I love. The Word of God is, this is mine, the Word of God is the most essential ingredient for true God-given revival. Mm. Whether it's the days of Ezra, the days of the Reformers, or our day. Mm, beautiful. What do we learn about God in this chapter, Jennifer? Well, this is kind of an interesting thought, but God is not addicted to human approval. So Ezra, led by God, confronted the popular sin of intermarriage. Yeah. And, you know, he could have ended up looking like a bit of a bigot, you know, right. and, and there was, it was, there was a lot of feelings, a lot of emotions, a lot of feelings that were going to get hurt, a lot of relationships mm. that were going to get hurt in the process of pulling off that reform. Um, God is careful with sinners, but he's clear on sin. 
Ooh. He'd rather look bad temporarily than compromise the truth that saves us eternally. You are a writer, sister. He, he lets himself look bad for a little for while. For the short term. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's because great. on the surface, I mean, you look at the Bible. No, I get on, it. I totally get it. marriage, sexuality, he looks like a prude on the surface. Right, on the surface. Until you do the deep dive. Yeah, God has set up these guardrails yeah. that allow for increased pleasure, even mm -hmm. maximal pleasure. That's right. Not the diminishment of pleasure. That's right. Uh... I put here, God offers and gives hope even in the midst of sin and rebellion. Because there's a line here. There's a line mm. here. Let me see if I can quickly find it. Mm. What is it? There's this great line. It's, it has the word hope in it. And she basically said, look up the word hope. She has this great line here. Oh, here it is. This is on page 591. There's a paragraph that begins, one of those present. Page 591, 623 of the original. One of those present, Shechaniah by name, oh, acknowledged yeah. as true all the words spoken by Ezra. We have trespassed against our God, he confessed, and have taken pagan wives from the peoples of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel in spite of this. I love that. Wait, yes, wait, we have wait, wait. sinned right here. Yet now it says, now, yet now there is hope in so Israel in spite of this. The hope in Israel concerning this thing. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, yeah. So you're re that's New King James. Oh, that's okay. King James. This is New okay, King James. Okay. So the idea here is just that mm -hmm. even in the midst of our sin, yeah. the moment that you have recognition of mm -hmm. sin, hope mm -hmm. blossoms. Mm -hmm. Like th th there's the opportunity yeah. for hope. You say, well, actually, I think I shouldn't be doing this thing. Th right in that moment, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, there it is. Because once mm -hmm. you have recognition, then you have admission, mm -hmm. then you have confession, then you have repentance. Right? Like, so even in the midst of the recognition of sin, there's hope there. Mm. But the person who does not recognize their sin, who can't, th there's no hope there because there's no traction. The spirit can't get any traction. This is yeah. ultimately what happens with the unpardonable sin, that the spirit just can't get traction yeah. because there's no recognition of sinfulness. Yeah, yeah. God comforts the broken. Exactly right. But they kind of have to be broken before they you can be receive broken. that comfort. But in the brokenness is the hope. That's right. Beautiful. Um, the prayer, how do we pray this chapter? Oh, okay, hang on. Um, God, raise up Ezra's and help us obey the spirits leading through them and bring a reconstruction of biblical faith. Ooh. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I like Ezra's in the plural. Yeah. Father, give me a deeper love and appreciation for your word and help me to say no to imaginary religion. Yeah. Remember, she's got that line in there about she imaginary religion. Really? Oh, it's so good. Yeah, let me see if I can find it. I'll find just type it. in imaginary. It's yeah, so it. good. Re, uh, the where, tremendous issues of eternity demand of us something besides an imaginary, imaginary religion. religion. Oh, a religion so of good. words, and then she develops it. She says, a, a religion of words and forms where truth is kept in the outer court. Correct. Oh, come on now. <laughs> it sounds like Peter when he says, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. And yeah. the word for fable there is muthos or myth. Yeah. It's like, we don't need myths. Yeah. We need the truth. We need solid stuff. We need substantive yeah. Mm. truth yeah stabilizing truth. stabilizing mm. truth okay how do we practice this chapter mm. um okay hang on so practice let's see what do i have here oh did we do did we do prayer we did uh we didn't do oh we did okay. yeah we did pray representative prayers humble your heart and count yourself in with the oh. erring feeble people yes. of god yes yes that's the practice i'm going to take away from it is i that love that spirit of representation like the, the count, solidarity, yeah. Solidarity. Yeah. Oh, that's good stuff. Yeah. I went with uh, 2 Timothy 2.15. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in Thessalonians. I'm like, that's not the right verse. Here we go. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. You know this. When I start it, you're going to immediately know it. Mm -hmm. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, or study to show thyself approved. Yeah. Unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, oh, rightly no, dividing the, the word, word of truth. truth. Second Timothy 2.15. So mm -hmm. how do we practice it? We study the Bible and mm -hmm. we learn what it's teaching, what it's not teaching, how to understand it, how to read it. And this is a lifelong pursuit. You know, it, it, you're not going to learn everything that you want to know and need to know and desire to know in a year or five years or 10 years. Mm -hmm. The study of scripture and the understanding of scripture is a lifelong pursuit, but mm -hmm. we should do it. We need to put ourselves... Mm -hmm in front of the text, put the text in front of us, and it will transform us. Mm. I'm then, so I'm so grateful for people who 
are gifted communicators that do that because it inspires the rest of us. We Preach. see what it looks like, yeah. Okay, Jennifer, last one, okay. what's the promise? I'm just quoting uh, Joel 2, rend your heart and not your garment and turn to the Lord your God for he is gracious and merciful. That's a promise right there, slow to anger and of great kindness and repents him of the evil. Mm. Who knows if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him. So it's a question, but it's saying if you turn, you'll get a blessing, essentially. I love it. Yeah. That's that's what she quotes it right at the end, doesn't she? Yes, she does. Yeah. She does. I went with Psalm 119, 165. Mm -hmm. You know this one too. I'll start it and you could probably finish it. Great peace okay. have they that love thy law and nothing, nothing shall, shall offend, offend them. them. Now, I like the NIV here, and nothing shall make them stumble. Mm. And we live in a world again where there are so many things so to stumble on. Yeah. But when we have this, and, and I love your word, this stabilizing influence mm -hmm. of the word, mm -hmm. we have peace. Yeah. The world is falling apart. It's this tottering mass, as she describes. Yeah. Yeah. But we can have peace, right? A peace that passes understanding. Which, when we read that, a peace that passes understanding, what that literally means is, a piece that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make any An sense. An irrational piece is almost what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. Like people are like, how can you have peace? It's how could Daniel have peace in the lion's den? It's supernatural. Exactly. It's That's what we need. Yeah. And we get that supernatural peace, that stabilizing peace that comes from God himself in the word. In the word. And apart from that stabilizing influence, we're going to depend on everything going right in the world around us. And we're going to be offended continually yeah. because people offend each other. And so the way to reduce the amount of offense is to be so grounded in God and his love for you yes. and his regard for yes. you that you don't depend as much on human beings always doing the right thing. <laughs> I mean, we live in a world no, where people are constantly getting get offended it. by each other. People love yeah, to be offended. They do. Okay, everybody, we hope you enjoyed that oh, session. Oh, word. Well, no, we're doing that right now. Oh. Ugh, I'm reaching oh. and failing. Oh, it's stuck on the tape. Okay. All right, everybody. We hope you enjoyed that. That was a total blast. What was your word for the chapter? Let's see. Stefan says, irrational human logic logos, which is why the Greeks believed that the mythos or the mythos deep religious story and narrative triumphed and was sacred. Okay, I missed that. Sorry, mm -hmm. Stefan. It's just going by too fast here. Hope, 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 word, 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 opportunity, rend, marriage. Rend is good. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Yeah. Recognize. Oh, I like marriage, by the way. Reformation. Influence, says Donna with a million exclamation points. Revival. <laughs> Study, says JJZ2000. That's my word. Mm. Study, Study is my word. Okay. Yep, she uses it over and over again. Mingling, stirred, return. My word is word. A lot of word. Us, word, teach, revival, mm -hmm. reformation, great words. Uh, return. I had, re I, return was one of my options. <laughs> We're back to the multi, uh, the multi. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay. Need. Uh, what else do we got here? Study was almost my word, says Makushala or Makaushala. Teach or teacher, example is my second word. 303 Syzygy says, my word is infinite. Ezra, yeah, that really impressed me too. Ezra's infinite patience. Mm, yeah. And tact was mm -hmm. provided by the infinite word that comes from the infinite. Good stuff. Example. Good stuff. Word returned. They returned to Jerusalem. They mm -hmm. returned the gold mm -hmm. to treasure. Yeah, we didn't talk I about return, that. return, yeah. Return to script. Was that your word, returned? Well, it was one of them. <laughs> How many words you got, girl? I'm such a cheater. Extended. Word equals study. Can't have one without the other. Hey, you're not wrong. I love the way that she uses the word study. She uses a number of synonyms for study as well, like seek and search. Yeah. In his study yeah. of the causes leading to the Babylonian-ish mm -hmm. captivity. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, whether Ezra, wherever Ezra labored, he's, there sprang up a revival. The study mm -hmm. of the Holy Scriptures. Mm -hmm. Uh, the books of the prophets were searched, uh, a failure to study and obey the scriptures. Uh, then this one, Christians should be preparing for what is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. In yeah. this preparation, they should 
make by diligently studying the word of God. And then the very last paragraph, mm. it says, uh, rich and poor, learned and ignorant, eagerly studied for themselves, talking about what took place in the mm, Protestant so Reformation. Right. Study, 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 study to show thyself approved oh, unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I'm Stephon says punctilious. Punctilious. Is that even in the... No, no, he just loves... He loves he, words. He, oh, he loves words. <laughs> I, I would say maybe 30% of the time I've never even heard the word that he uses. I don't think it's in here. Um, lessons. Influence was my second word. I almost chose study for both chapters. Yeah, you could. You could easily do that because she does yeah. use the word study in the first chapter, mm -hmm. chapter 50. Mm -hmm. She also uses the word providence in this chapter, which mm -hmm. was my word from the last chapter. So there's a mm -hmm. real sort of like part one, part two mm -hmm. in chapters 50 mm -hmm. and 51. Yeah. Stefan says, punctilious, showing great attention to detail or correct behavior. Yeah, I know that word. Mm -hmm. Punctilious. Mm -hmm. His punctilious behavior. <laughs> um, what else do we got here? He does love his words. Torah. Gerald says, what's the meaning of Ezra's name? I didn't look it up. Mm, I, I, I should have looked it up. Jennifer's word. Jennifer, did you have a word? What was your word word? Well, you know, I, I'm going to go with your study. I think it summarizes the chapter. Convinced. But I am. But I like the word opportune. The very oh, yeah. Opening it opens with opportune. Of the, of the chapter is that um, Ezra's arrival in Jerusalem was opportune. opportune. Very good. Which is just basically a synonym for providential. It's providence. Yeah. It's that same concept. So I like the word studied. I like the word return. Mm -hmm. Um, somebody here says hard. I picked hard. They did the hard work in this mm. chapter. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. All right, everybody. We hope you enjoyed that. Oh, I mean, yeah. for being as tired as I was, I was you exhausted. Because, I mean, I've been awake since, as I say, 2.30 in the morning. We are back tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. We'll... Man needs a night of sleep. I need a good night's sleep, which I'm going to get. Um, we'll be... Back. We'll, we'll come on about 15 minutes early tomorrow, again, just to answer any questions. Now, we're going to just take good questions for Jennifer. Um, what? Yeah, we're going to just, whatever questions come up, Jenny, oh, you have okay, to answer okay. them. In the 10 minutes. In the 10 or 15 okay. minutes. Okay. Ezra means help or helper. That's a great oh, name cool. for Ezra. We're almost done with the book. Yeah, you're right. I mean, we're down. We're getting down to the I wire. mean, there's only 60 chapters, and tomorrow we're going to do chapters 52 and 53. I leave for Australia in like eight days, right? So we got work to do, ladies and gentlemen. We got work to do. So this was a great session. We love you all so much. Um, I can't wait for yeah. tomorrow. What are our chapters tomorrow? Did you look at them? Um, yeah, they're um, they're going to be on Nehemiah, right? Or are we not to Nehemiah? A man yet? of opportunity. Nehemiah, so that's Nehemiah. And the builders of the wall. So it's right, basically we did Ezra tonight. We'll do Nehemiah tomorrow. Hey, Mikey Minimo, my brother. Okay. Um, by the way, Mikey, I well, I got something to tell you. So send me a text. I'll tell you something that you'll find encouraging. Uh, let's let's pray. Let's you opened it. all close. Father in heaven. Help us to experience the revival that can come only yes. from humbly and consistently placing ourselves in front of your word and your word in front of us. That's right. Father, transform us, revive us, convict us, encourage us, give us hope, even in the midst of our failures, our sins, our rebellion. Lord, help mm. us to see that the awareness of our brokenness and our sin mm -hmm. is the very blossoming of hope. That's right. The sprouting of That's hope. Right. And so, yeah. Father, we receive that. Um, Father, help us to walk that important, distinct line between being healthily unsatisfied with our spiritual condition, but not unhealthily unsatisfied. Father, we want to be poor in spirit, yeah. but we don't want to become so scrupulous and, and self... Guilt-ridden. Exactly, guilt-ridden and so looking into ourselves that our religion becomes mainly about us and our performance. That's right. We want our religion to be about Jesus and his performance. That's right. And Father, it's our great privilege... And our great honor to pray in his name. Amen. 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 And amen. Amen.